Hello friends, it's Roger Christofferson here again with another album battle. Um, this week I decided to go with uh, Rush, which I actually wasn't going to do for another few weeks, but with the announcement of Neil Peart's passing on Friday, I thought, you know, maybe it was a good time to talk about Rush and uh, the influence Neil had had on not just drummers, but um, musicians of all kinds. I mean, if you've been online or any type of social media lately, you've probably seen all kinds of uh, musicians from all you know, different styles of music uh, mentioning what kind of influence Neil had on their lives. And not only that, what, what, a, what a great guy he was. And, you know, he had uh, I mean, just countless videos I've been watching of him just being a good person and, and you know, doing encouraging videos for younger players. And, I mean, you will never find anything that I've seen that where he's ever had anything bad to say about anybody. He was just a really nice guy suffered some major tragedies in his own life with the passing of his daughter and his wife all within 10 months of each other. And uh, I guess kind of the positive thing of anything of this is the, we can kind of rest knowing that he's with his family again. I guess that's kind of a, I don't know, helps ease the, uh, the loss a little bit, I guess. I don't know. Maybe for me it does. I'm not sure if you know, it's the same for everybody, but we all deal with this type of thing in our different ways, so... Anyway, um, the two that I chose um, to battle it out this week were uh, Grace Under Pressure and 2112. And as always, the reason I choose the, you know, the albums I do this with is because of the influence they had on me, or maybe the uh, order in which I discovered them. I was a little bit late to the game with Rush. Um, Obviously, I'd heard, you know, Tom Sawyer and Limelight and, um, what was it, Subdivisions and uh, Digital Man. I know I'd, a lot of my fellow musicians and classmates, because I was in high school at the time, um, you know, were listening to all these songs. I'd heard them, but I wasn't hugely impacted by them at that point in time. I was still fairly young in my uh, guitar playing and songwriting and musical discovery at that point. But... Uh, there's a local radio station that had this thing called the Six Pack. You may hear me mention this every now and then, but they would play six albums in a row. It was Sunday night at midnight, so it was like midnight before I was going back to school from the weekend, you know, to Monday morning. So I would stay up all night. I would set my alarm to whatever album I thought I might want. But uh, Rush, Grace Under Pressure, was one of the albums they played on the Six Pack. So they played the whole entire album. So I stayed recorded it, you know, on my little uh, tape recorder. And, this one, when I heard it, very first time, huge impact. Um, the whole album just, just grabbed me and everything about it. I mean, opening, distant, early warning. The guitar, one thing I will say is the guitars on this album were a lot different than anything they had done on their previous albums. They were more experimental very lush, a lot of full reverb sounding. This was recorded at La Studio, so it was one of the, the albums that they did at La Studio. Um, so they, whatever albums they did there had that similar production style as mid-80s, so they had that uh, mid-80s typical you know, production to it. Um, although Terry Brown did, didn't produce this one as, like he did on the, he did produce a lot of the earlier ones, but he didn't produce this one. Um, so just an early warning, it just had that um, it was a slower building song, but then it built up. It had those big, huge power chords with the keyboards and the guitar all, you know, when it finally reached its crescendo. Just really grabs you. Um, then it went to After Image, which was more, um, started out a little bit more mellow, but it did have that uh, cool little reach out and grab you section there, too. With the, uh, the triplets, you know, the album playing in unison there for a little bit and then going off to, you know, the separate the weird things that they always did in their songs. Um, and Red Sector A, third track on there, another huge one that uh, is still, I think they played that a lot in their live shows too, if I'm not mistaken. Although, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to see them live. I, that's one thing I do regret, is I never got to see these guys live. Um, yeah, Red Sector A, great song. I actually just listened to this one last night on, uh, I think it was Rock and Rio was one of the discs I was playing there that they did this one on. Um, and then The Enemy Within, also another great song. Um, 
I think that was the one that starts with the uh, kind of a, it's got a reggae type ska type guitar um, part to it, but it's really fast, so it's kind of a weird combination of things to throw at each other, but that's Rush, that's what they did. Um, Into the Body Electric, um, another great song. Um, you know, another thing I will point out about these is that they're all fairly long songs. There's only eight songs in this album, and clocks out around 40 minutes, so they're all fairly long songs. Not a lot of soloing, there's a little bit of um, stuff in the middle of a couple of them where, you know, uh, Alex is uh, doing some experimental, you know, and remember there's a lot of harmonics he throws out in there, and not like really chords, but a lot of harmonics he's throwing out. Just, and it's amazing how full this album sounds. Just the three, I mean, you've heard that probably a million times from a lot of people, but how full they sound with only three of them. And, and the keyboards were not a lot, very overpowering on this album. There's a lot of keyboards, but it's a guitar-heavy album. There's a lot of guitar in this album. Um, same thing with uh, Kid Gloves, um, and Red Lenses, Between the Wheels, all three of those just great rockers, um, you know, the, all have different uh, intros to them, and, and nothing about these is like typical of anything at that point in time on the radio or anything, but I heard these songs consistently on the radio, especially Distant Early Warning and uh, Red Sector A were two of the ones that I remember that radio station would play a lot of. So, yeah, that's what got me into Rush. Um, still didn't buy Moving Pictures after that one. The very next album I, I bought, I was did the whole you know Columbia House like probably everybody my age did at that time. Where you get like 13 albums for a penny, and then you got to buy like 12 more or something over the next year or two. I don't know. I don't think anybody ever ended up buying the full amount, <laughs> but. Uh, 2112 was actually one of the ones I got off of that one. And uh, the funny thing about that is when I got it, I didn't realize when I first couple listens through that the tape, because I've got it on cassette, was only half of what it was supposed to be. It would, it, they, it's like a, it was a, an accident they had done at the, uh, the factory or something where they only made it uh, half of it. So like in the middle of presentation, it would click over the side too and it would pick up in the middle of lessons. So... I remember after listening to it a couple times, I'm like, man, this is a really short album. What the heck's going on here? So I, at that point, I realized, oh, I got kind of screwed over a little bit. They only gave me half the album on this thing. It's the only time that's ever happened to me. But you know, after that, I, you know, there's not a big return policy with Columbia House, so I had to live live with that for a little bit until I finally, you know, I don't know, I mean, I was, you know, I had a paper out at the time. I was making a whole lot of money, so I had to wait until I could save up enough to actually go buy it again. Unfortunately, I kind of missed out on a couple songs for a while but anyway so this one starts with uh, 2112 which uh, shows off uh, Neil's amazing lyrics um, obviously not the overture but the overall thing was uh, based on uh, Anne Rind and uh, her writings and I mean, as a kid I just thought it was a cool concept you know this guy finds a guitar and he makes this great music with it and they try to tell him he can and uh, just the you know it's kind of a cool concept and you know when you're a teenager it's uh, it was pretty cool at that point in time um overture is still like probably one of my favorite rush tunes of all time I usually when you hear it on the radio they play it with temples of syrinx and you got gettys um you know soaring sky high vocals on both of those songs which i have to give him credit he actually kept playing that song live for quite a few years and wasn't quite killing it like it was back in the day but he was giving it a go that's for sure um and then you know discovery the whole uh sounding like he's tuning the guitar and taking around the presentation or the whole story it just it ends in the big bombastic explosion at the end and um you know that was probably my first um introduction to you know, like a concept type album. Even though I, Tommy from The Who was the first one I ever really got into, but that was, they kind of did that one as a rock opera, and you know, that's what it was being billed at. It was This was just kind of like a small concept uh, album. Whereas Side 2 was just individual songs. Uh, started with Passages to Bangkok, which was one of the ones I missed out on in my first listen through, but um, pretty cool song. Uh, I remember when I finally got to hear it, I was like, oh, this is this is pretty sweet. Uh, Twilight Zone, which is also one of the ones I missed out on. Uh, 
I was a huge Twilight Zone fan as a kid. I loved, you know, the the show. And if you listen to the lyrics to the song, it's actually different episodes of the Twilight Zone kind of thrown in. Uh, so that's yeah, what that one's about, anyway. Uh, and then Lessons, which that's kind of an interesting song. It's got this upbeat acoustic guitar which I never really heard in much rock music before up until this point. Maybe with Boston, but I didn't really listen to them a whole lot at that point in time. Um, still more into the heavier side of things. And great uh, guitar work on that one. Uh, the uh, leads and you know the squeals that Alex did there in the choruses are pretty cool. I always like that. Um, Tears, one of the my least favorite Rush songs, I do have to say. It wasn't one that really ever did much for me. It's a decent song, but it's this kind of one that I could skip over and never, never miss. So unfortunately, you know, I have to kind of, first one, I have to rank kind of low. And then, you know, the album ends out with Something for Nothing, which is a, just a upbeat rocker, good song. Um, just a good song. So those are my first uh, introductions to Rush. And of course, I went on to get, I think Cress of Steel was the one I got after that, which is great heavy album too but learned to, to really enjoy a rush from that point on I actually ended up playing limelight in one of the bands i was in over the years which is actually a really difficult song to play when you get to the middle section there um because i played bass in that band so that was that was a challenge back you know 30 years ago when i was learning how to play that one um but uh yeah some really cool albums um i guess if i had to choose because i guess that's what we do in here even though there is no winner we're just talking about music just because, you know, maybe you guys haven't pulled these albums out in a while. Maybe you guys have never listened to these albums or you don't, never thought about them in the way that maybe somebody else does. You know, it's the fun to go back and listen to these things and remember what it was that inspired us or maybe you've never heard them before, so maybe it will inspire you to listen to more Rush. Uh, so anyway, that being said... I think I'm just going to have to stick with Grace Under Pressure because I actually listened to this one here about two months back because I was remembering how much I liked that album when I first heard it. So I went back and listened to it again. That one, still, I hear something new every time I listen to it. Even though I do it with a lot of Rush albums, I, it's the one I always go back to. It's the first one I remember listening to, and it's the one I'll probably, you know, always have the biggest impact on me. You know, that's where it all started. So that's what I'm going to have to go with. Well, anyway, you know, feel free to leave your comments on what your guys' favorites are. Um, if you feel like you're listening to anything that uh, they've inspired me to do, feel free to check out my music over at Roger Christofferson's YouTube channel or my uh, Bandcamp, RogerChristoffersonBandcamp.com, uh, or anything out there on Spotify, iTunes, and all those fun places. You can find some of my stuff. Um, but anyway, yeah. Until next time, uh, hopefully it uh, will be a little more upbeat one, but uh, appreciate everything you guys uh, have to comment on, and thanks for listening. See you later.